Before I start, I would like to take a moment to say thank you to uh, Dr. Canham for creating this opportunity and further for the words that he offered in the beginning. Um, I think I, I just I wrote, actually wrote them down because I think uh, it's probably some of the most fun and most important things I've heard about research, which in my, my takeaway was be kind and have fun and teach. And I think without those, um, those are sort of the sine qua knowns to what, what I think are a successful career. Um, there's another quote from a previous chairman of mine called Lou Harrison, who the radiation oncologists in the room will know, um, which is that on your tombstone, uh, it won't say how many publications you've had. Um, it'll talk about the impact you've made on people. And I think that this is sort of the same message. And so um, I'm hoping to teach you something to teach you something about today about personalized genomic radiation therapy. Um, but I also hope that all of you know that I, I try to be kind during all of my interactions with folks. And, and also, um, I'm having a ton of fun. And I think that the winding road that Dr. Wong described of my career um, is, is less about um, changing fields because I ran into dead ends and more about chasing what I thought was fun at the time. And it didn't always line up. And I think the winding road you showed, Dr. Wong, was really um, an exciting thing to see because uh, it's really, truly sort of how I think about my career to date. It is, has been a winding road, but the reason it's wound is because sometimes twists and turns can be a lot of fun and, and valuable, but you never know where they're going to lead. So if it feels good, do it, be kind, and teach. So thank Dr. Canham, and um, without further ado, I will start my talk. Um, so today I think I'd like to describe how we can use existing technologies in the form of gene expression together with old technology, which is um, sort of classical radiation biology, to increase uh, the efficacy of radiation therapy now. And I'm going to walk you through a series of papers that we've written over the course of the last five or six years and describe how I think this all works. Um, I'm happy for anyone to share any of this. Uh, everything here is either published or pre-printed. Um, and even if it's not, I'm happy for you to share it. Um, I've given information about how to contact me there. And I'd love to have folks reach out if there's questions or comments. Um, and so I'm going to hope that my slides will advance. So I think um, I've got two disclosures to make. Um, one is that most of the, most of the technology within this uh, talk have been co -invented, invented or co-invented by me and a colleague called Javier Torres Roca. And uh, he founded a company that owns it in which I'm part. Um, and so I certainly have some biases, which I think um, it's important to share. Um, further, there's a scientific disclosure that I think we as a field of radiation oncology need to disclose to ourselves that every day we go to clinic, we treat patients with, experiment, uh, with doses based on experiments done almost 100 years ago. And I think it's important that we um, recognize that. And so this picture, I think every radiation oncologist and, and biophysicist will recognize from our Bible. Um, these are the experiments, Don Rams in the 20s, that gave us our standard doses of 50, 60, and 70 gray and our fractionation schemes of two gray per day. Um, and I think it's important that we recognize that. We've made incredible advances in our fields, which I'll describe, but for the most part, the biology is 100 years old. And... Um, I hope that during the course of this talk, you feel, uh, the, for the clinicians and medical physicists, I hope I can instill in you a feeling of discomfort, as a matter of fact, because when I go to clinic, I feel uncomfortable. Uh, just on Friday, one of my patients who I was treating, who I am treating currently, has an angiosar angiosarcoma on her face, which was surgically removed with negative margins. So, of course, I'm giving her 60 gray, which is the post-op standard sarcoma dose. And she asks, why are you giving me 60 gray? And I didn't show her this picture, but I was, but I was um, honest in that, you know, it's empiric and we don't have a real reason. And I hope that during the course of this talk, the data that I show you and the models that I show you make you progressively uncomfortable with what we do every day. And because without discomfort, change doesn't occur. And we as a field in radiation oncology have gotten quite comfortable with what we do. And I think that's stopping us from continuing and changing and growing. And I'd, I'd like to create that discomfort. 
So um, here's a little ad for my lab. Uh, as Dr. Wong suggested, we do a lot of thinking about uh, about the evolutionary process. And I am a physicist by original training. And um, you know, physicists care mostly about the answer as, as opposed to the tools. And so in our laboratory, we use a whole host of different mathematical tools um, from si hybrid cellular automata, which are computerized or computer models. Um, through standard statistics, through um, analytical models of stochasticity and and change through evolutionary games, but as a as a as an MD, we also aren't afraid to stick needles in people, um, and and as a as a sort of biologist by default, we're also growing and thinking about cancer cells as well as um, uh, bacteria, as you can see, sort of pictures of. So we really cover the gamut of experimental and mathematical tools in our laboratory because it's really the central question that's most interesting to me. And that central question is, is how do the diseases that affect man in particular, uh, mankind, in particular um, pathogens, viruses, bacteria, and others, and cancer um, defeat us? And, and I think the real answer is evolution because our therapies work until they don't. And the, the reason they, they stop working is because Darwinian evolution is smarter than we are. Um, and I think all of those questions come down to the process of understanding evolution better rather than just trying to stay one step ahead. Um, so that's the central focus of the laboratory. Um, and, and a small side focus is also specifically radiation genomics. And that's what I'll talk about today. But I have a, a wide interest in these other processes, which I would love to share at a different time. I also want to say up front how grateful I am to the, the diverse and wonderful group of people that I get to work with. Oftentimes this is the final slide, but I think it bears mentioning early. Um, this is a, a subset of the group of folks that I'm, I'm, I'm privileged to work with in our laboratory. Um, a lot of the work you'll see today was done by uh, Jeff Sidor on the upper right in green, um, and, then, uh, and then myself. But I think that the entire group is really what what it's important to recognize and you know together this is a in person this is more fun but the robot in the middle is a, is a robot called Voltron from sort of the 80s um, and the, the story of Voltron is important in that there's five robot lions which you can see listed there that are all pretty good at defending the planet but when the when the problem is really serious they all come together like a transformer and create this this robot and this is how I really feel about interdisciplinary science and you know I think I, people come to my lab or our lab um, usually trained in one thing. So maybe they're a red lion because they're really good at maths, for example. But over the course of understanding and working together as a group, we really um, come together and form a much more powerful uh, force in science, in science. And I think I'm really grateful to the people that I get to work with and, and grateful to the folks who, who are brave enough to fund the weird research that we do, um, in particular the, the, what I've listed here. So thanks to everyone. Um, and then what I want to do is give you sort of an overlying, an overarching opinion of how I think cancer sort of works. And I think of cancer as a really complex adaptive system. Um, and you can think of this as, so that picture of the people and the graph isn't supposed to be there quite yet, but so ignore that for the moment. But if you think about how cancer develops starting at time zero, so this, the arrows on the top there are time. And as it goes from a single cancer cell, maybe this, maybe it's the second hit that's occurred, over time, as that tumor grows and evolves, what really happens is a heterogeneity develops through the course of time, through evolutionary branching points, through interspecies competition, through all sorts of mutation and selection events, until what you really have is at that time of biopsy, we end up with a beautiful heterogeneity. We have thousands or millions of different types of clones, which we in our laboratory often think of as species. So you have an entire ecosystem of cancer cells and normal cells that work together uh, to create what is the tumor. What the standard research usually does is sort of biopsy that, sequence it maybe, maybe do a number of other phenotypic tests to understand what is there and try to understand what's going on. But what we're normally doing is solving the lamppost problem. The lamppost problem famously is, if there's a dark field and someone told you they've lost their keys, but there's one lamp in the middle of the field shining light on a small area, pretty much everyone's going to look in the lamplight. Um, and the issue with that is that if you're looking for mechanisms of, of resistance or, or targets, that you're, you're only going to find what you're looking for. Um, but I think the beauty of this is that there's a whole lot more going on. And so in our laboratory, we, instead of really trying to look for what's, what's been shown, we really think about the process that creates this heterogeneity. So we think about evolutionary branching points and how um, mathematical models say of, of optimization or fitness, very similar to 
um, medical physics models for like simulated annealing for reverse for reverse planning work. We think about interspecies competition through ecological modeling, like evolutionary game theory, and we think about the ideas of convergent evolution and how these can be used to derive biological signatures to to go through drug response. And in particular, thinking about um, radiation sensitivity, I think that's sort of where this talk is going to come in together with the entirety of, of our work. And so, yes. And so what about right now? So that, that's the overall goal. But the question we're going to try to answer today is what about this worldview can we use to think about personalizing radiation therapy with what we already know? So I'm not going to teach you about trying to find new genes that control radiation sensitivity. I'm not going to talk about master regulation. I'm not going to talk about um, the biology in that sense. I'm going to talk about how I think we can take existing models of, that are tried and true in the clinic, linear quadratic model we'll talk about, um, together with um, – just gene expression models and, and surrogate models of signatures to understand how we can modulate radiation sensitivity, um, and in particular to do better when, for when our individual patient comes in, like the woman I'm treating now, who asked, why 60 gray? Um, and so, you know, this isn't a new idea in oncology. So precision medicine, of course, we're in the era of precision medicine for medical oncology. This has been happening for more than a decade, right? We have Oncotype, we have... Um, Precision RT. We, we have sorry, we have uh, a number of other signatures of we have Mammaprint, uh, a number of other signatures of chemotherapy response, especially for targeted therapies, crizotinib. We have for lung cancer. There's a matrix five pages long on how to treat individual patients, um, and this is standard. And in radiation therapy, anyone who's been to clinic knows that we have a massive difference in personalization, right? So these are actually three women. This is this is the right thigh of three women that I treated in my first month as an attending, all of whom had what looked like identical incisions. These were all women who had 20 centimeter undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcomas of their right thigh. They were all between 65 and 75, and they were all, um, one on the left was an African-American woman, the one on the right and the one in the middle were both um, white ca Caucasian women, um, and one was fair-skinned, the one in the, in the middle, as a matter of fact, and one was less so, the one on the right. And I gave all three of these women 60 gray. Um, and you can notice that the radiation response to their normal tissue differed widely. The woman on the right had to go back to the operating room. The woman in the middle needed simply some aquaphor and some um, anti-itch medication, basically. The woman on the left had, had no issues with the radiation at all. And I think, like I said, anyone who spent even a couple of days in a radiation oncology clinic knows that this is every patient differs wildly. And yet we give the same dose to every woman or every man and woman or every person who comes in our clinic. And so for me, this was a real call to arms. And I think, you know, when we think about precision oncology and radiation oncology, we think about the massive successes that physics has given us. So radiation therapy is the single most common therapeutic given in all of oncology. We have this beautiful progression from 2D planning all the way to VMAP planning, which I could anyone can, knows now, where we have this unbelievable ability to, to personalize anatomically dose distributions. Um, and a fun little side story is I, I gave a version of this talk in Melbourne at the Peter McCallan Cancer Center in, uh, in Melbourne, and I showed this slide, and it turns out that um, one of the members in the audience was the person who made this woodcut on the left. Um, I didn't know that, but it was really quite a lot of fun to connect in that way. Um, and I think this was done in, uh, in Ontario as well. And so uh, I think we really owe medical physics almost everything we do in radiation oncology today, but from SBRT to SRS to all of the changes in side effect profiles with IMRT and VMAT. So the things we do today are incredible. But I would argue that there is yet to be any biological precision in radiation therapy. And this is frustrating and what I'm hoping to address today. And so I'm going to show a short 30-second video, and I just actually sent this video to the woman who I'm treating today. So I'm going to give you a small introduction, and I have hopefully I've, I've shared sound. So this is Zarina, who is the pirate fairy who lives in the Tinkerbell universe in Disney, if you're familiar. Um, and this is her line manager, Fairy Gary. And what you're going to see, so this movie is sort of all about um, Zarina, who's a dust keeper fairy, and um, I think that... Zarina and I share a lot of 
a lot of things in common. So I'm going to play this, and I hope you can all hear the sound. Wow. Be careful now. Now I want you to, in your minds, replace blue fairy dust with photons or fractions of radiation. Last time, I'm sure I don't have to remind you just how potent and powerful No touch. I promise. Atta girl. All right, then. Exactly 26 specs. But why 26? And here we go. Why not 25? What would happen if we put in, say, 27? We put in 26. But why? Ah, Zarina, you're the most inquisitive fairy I've ever known. Correction, it's a tie. Let's just say... You're the tinkerbell of Doskeepers. So why do you say it like it's a bad thing? Because we don't work with twigs and acorn caps. We work with pixie dust. It's our lifeblood. There's no room for error. And so this is how I feel when the patients ask me these same questions. Why are you giving me 30 fractions of radiation? And the answer is because, it's because we give 30. And if you then ask, but why which is what I started to do when I was a second year resident, people get a bit uncomfortable. And the answer to why is because we give 30 fractions. And it becomes a tautology. And the frustration there for me and, and for, my, for my patients is that I have no real rational basis beside those experiments in RAMS. And so I'm hoping to show you now how, if you're like Zarina, like I am, um, how you can not just annoy your line manager, but how we can move forward, or I hope, um, so let's see. So, so why has dose been such an elusive question? Um, you know, I think everyone's probably familiar with the recent trial of 60 versus 74 in uh, non-small cell lung cancer uh, with chemotherapy, where everyone was sure. So this is RTOG 0617, which has recently been published as a negative trial. I think everyone's aware that um, you know going into this, people were quite sure that 74 gray would be uh, beneficial. And in fact, the 60 gray arm won out. Now, there's lots of reasons why people have postulated that this has happened. Um, most of them center around either planning issues or side effects or both. Um, but at the same time, that being said, classical models of radiation biology would suggest, and the power calculations are done appropriately such that even with um, non-tissue, uh, normal tissue complications, the 74 gray should have won easily and did not. Um, I would argue that you know, in this trial, there was no stratification based on anything to do with personalization. So thinking about those women's thighs we saw a moment ago, what if the normal tissues responded similarly? And what if all the patients who got 60 didn't need any more than that, and the patients who got 74 didn't either? You'd see no difference. And then all of a sudden, the only thing that would drive outcomes is, is complications. But if you're blinded to who needs what, it's not, it's, not, it's not obvious that you would win out. And I, I want to show you eventually over the course of this talk how I think we can get there. So I'm going to hearken back to the paper that really opened my eyes. In my second week as a resident, this paper from Javier Torres Roca and et al. came out showing, this is from 2009 in the Red Journal. This paper showed how a way to make um, a gene expression-based signature to predict SF2 so surviving fraction after two gray. And they used 7,000 genes. They did some systems biology, which and um, some sort of network biology, which was at the time all the rage. And they came up with a, a simple 10 gene signature. And through the course of this, here's the 10 genes. They interact in some way. And this simple equation came out. So SF2 equals this equation. So you take the, the ranking of the genes, you multiply it by some constants, you get a number, and you're able to predict um, SF2 very, very well in a pan-cancer set of cell lines. So it's a simple, clinically useful tool. So every time, I'm not going to go into the details of this, of the, of the network here in particular, but every time I show this, um, most, most of the cancer biologists in the room either look for the gene that they like and find it and are happy, or but maybe they wonder why it's the, the eighth most important instead of the most important, or they find that, they, that the gene of their interest isn't here. For example, NERF2, which is uh, friends of mine have shown over the course of many years that it's incredibly important in radiation response. And the question is always, well, how, how can this be the signature for radiation response if my gene's not here? Or how can this gene, how, why do you need these other ones when mine is, is the most important and it is there? And I think instead we need to re rethink how we imagine these signatures. And they're, they're not mechanistic tools. They're instead maybe canaries in the coal mine. And so it could be that each of the genes in this subgraph of the much larger network of gene expression is really just simply picking up signals from throughout this network and giving us a readout of phenotype. 
And so th this is the model that I'm going to use as the basis for SF2. Um, and like I said, this is not my work. This is Javier's, but my work follows on and takes how to t go from this to something useful. So um, before I started, it, so this is in 2012, and this was the year I really jumped into this research, but this work was already done. What they had done beautifully was showed that this radiation sensitivity index, or RSI, is very um, predictive and not prognostic. And that's important. Because what that means is that it's truly a, um, an outcome, a radiation outcome measure. So here's an example of some data from clinical cancer research where they showed that in the patients who did receive radiation therapy, this signature could dichotomize outcomes quite well. So you have a Kappa-Meyer curve on the left that shows that patients who are predicted to do well did well, and patients who had a poor radiation response did poorly. And on the right, that same signature with the same cut point predicts nothing for patients who did not receive radiation therapy. So it really predicts any, only things in our treated patients. And then over the course of 10 years or so, this was done over and over and over again in different disease sites, breast, lung, GBM, pancreas, prostate, head and neck, and, and now also endometrium, sarcoma, and some others. And so every time this has been tested, it's been shown to be radiation specific um, with a cut point, but, but up until the work that we're, I'm gonna to present to you in a moment, it was only shown as a yes, no indicator of good or bad response. Now the problem with that is that no one really wants to know that answer. So let's take glioblastoma as an example. If you're a radiation oncologist, and a patient comes to your office who's had a newly resected glioblastoma, um, what do you do? Well, the answer is temozolomide and radiation therapy, of course. So if the patient then comes to you and says that they have a radiation sensitivity index that suggests, suggests that they're radiation resistant, are you gonna, what are you gonna do? Well, you're still gonna offer them radiation. And so at the end of the day, knowing whether they're sensitive or resistant only doesn't help you. Because if you only have one hammer, as we have, um, you're gonna use it when the trials have shown it over the years. And so really this hasn't been, at this point, a useful tool. Um, but in about 2015, we were actually sort of um, hammering against the deadline for, uh, for Astro when we decided to, to take a look at all this data at once. So what we did was we first plotted the radiation sensitivity index, that same 10 gene signature score, for something like 8,500 patients in our database. And what we saw was this beautiful heterogeneity. So RSI is continuous, but we've been looking at it as a cut point. So we've only been looking at whether it was high or low. And we've been sort of looking at high or low sort of based on the arbitrary idea of good versus bad outcome. So we were asking what cut point of high versus low best splits our cohorts. But what that's missing is the fact that there's a broad spread of heterogeneity here that we weren't taking advantage of. So RSI is a heterogeneous measure. It spans everything from something like 0 to 1. And as a matter of fact, we, we later are going to normalize it on 0 to 1. And so the utility of a yes or no indicator is quite limited. But, but let's harken back now to 1950s-based work where we understand what the surviving fraction is mathematically. Well, the surviving fraction is simply something on 0 to 1 that looks like a negative exponential function. And anyone in medical physics or radiation biology or radiation oncology is very familiar with this equation. And it's sort of the basis of all radiation biology, which also is the basis for a lot of our work in, clin in clinical radiation oncology. But now recall that RSI itself was SF2, is a, pre sorry, is a predictor of SF2, a surrogate for SF2. So if we plug RSI in for the surviving fraction and we plug two in for the dose and one in for the number of fractions, we should be able to understand and resolve the equation and rearrange the equation and solve for a genomically based alpha, which we can do as I showed you there. And so what you can now do is instead of asking the question, what happens if I give this patient two gray, we can ask what happens, what is the effect, what is the genomic effect of two gray? And so you can see here, you end up with something that looks like a negative exponential function, assuming beta is constant. And so you have this, this sort of quite scary idea to me, which is that when I give, let's, let's, take two, let's take an example of two different patients. Let's take a patient with a radiation sensitivity index of 0 0.2 and a patient with a radiation sensitivity of 0 0.8 as just examples. We have, a, in every single disease that I've shown, we have examples of both of these types of patients within disease. And now if I give each of those patients two gray, this, this curve tells you the, the radiation effect of that 
is going to be something like close to 2 gray for the patient with 0.2, but the patient with 0.8 is going to be something close to 0.25. So there's really an eight-fold difference in the effect of that 2 gray. So now we get really hot and bothered about plus or minus 5% differences in our treatment planning, plus or minus 1% differences in our sensitivities, hot spots of 10% or more. But now I'm telling you that you have an eight-fold difference in biological effect. However, this doesn't even come into our calculations. And this, to me, is the scariest plot I've ever seen, which means that some patients to whom I give 60 gray experience something like 60 gray, and some patients to whom I give 60 gray experience something like 8 gray, 7 gray. So what does that mean? Well, well it's, a, it's a scary prospect because well, all of a sudden we have massive differences. So let's take, it, let's take as an example the same prospective trial I showed you from clinical cancer research a moment ago. So we make this linear transform. So on the left is just a, a distribution of the patients in that trial with all of their measured RSIs. So we span from 0.1 all the way to 0.8 with this sort of bump in the middle, we sort of expect. If you do the transform, you now get a range, a distribution of alphas for the patients in this trial. So now, so this is all breast cancer, mind you. If we then ask the question, what happens if we apply standard fractionation, so the patients with breast cancer, so they're going to get 50 gray, we now have a distribution on the right of genomically effective radiation dose, or genomically adjusted radiation dose, where we have a six-fold difference between 10 and 60 between the patient who had the highest effect from radiation and the patient who had the lowest effect from radiation. So a six-fold difference in the same small cohort for the same, quote-unquote, same radiation dose. Um, and this, to me, is, is a scary concept. When I started plotting these distributions for the first time, I started to get really nervous because if you're giving the patient, maybe the patient who mo- has the strongest effect maybe you're overdosing them by three times. The patient with the lowest effect, maybe you're underdosing them by two times. Who knows? Really, there's this bump in the middle of most of the patients who probably are doing pretty well with 50 gray, but but at the end of the day, it's quite a scary concept to think how vastly different the biological effect of the physical dose we're giving is. So what was now a previously high cut point is now translated into something that we can change. Because you remember, we went to get from alpha to guard, like we've done here, we had to understand what the dose was. Previously, we give everyone 50 gray, but now I'm showing you that if you give 50 gray to this patient, you'll get this guard. But I could just as easily give a patient 60 or 40 and understand where that falls into the spectrum. So now we have a tool by which to understand the effect of a given dose for a given patient using gene expression and the linear quadratic model. So the question is then, is, is this a useful measure? So, so what if we think about this in a pan-cancer kind of way? So this is from the paper we wrote a few years ago in Lancet Oncology. And if you take all of the cancers that we treat, or the vast majority of them, and sort of line them up by the standard doses we give, we go from esophagus and the sort of the ones in yellow I've listed here are kind of the standard lowish dose tumors that we do we treat? And the ones in red are the sort of higher dose tumors that we treat with radiation. And we think about plugging these numbers in to those distributions I showed you, we get some interesting effects. So now we, we literally do what I just showed you is we take all of the patients we measured with cervix cancer and we plug in the dose that we give them. And if we do this all the way down the line with standard of care dose, we almost get a perfect readout of radio curability. So what I'm showing you here are violin plots. The, the red dot is the median for each of these diseases. I'm, I'm going to show you three plots in a row. One, this is the high standard of care dose group. And if you look, notice all of these, sorry, the, the high standard of care dose groups. So this is what the experienced guard is. And if you look at these, these are all diseases that are radio curable in a very high proportion of patients. As we start to move toward the mid of this, we start to see big differences. We start to see lung at the top, breast, and all the way down to glioma, where we're not curing folks at all. So we really see the median of all these distributions lining up beautifully with what we know happens clinically. And so we're still preserving this heterogeneity within disease. So between disease, we're seeing what we already know. And within disease, we're seeing what I see is a huge opportunity for for differences. So then we all, all go, go, keep going down the list of these low-dose ones, to see diseases that we almost never cure with radiation therapy. We could argue that kidneys that we have changed now because of hypofractionation, but we're talking about standard fractionation today.
And so what this shows you is that you know, giving a high dose of radiation in gray doesn't guarantee you a high effect of your radiation. So if we look on the left in panel A, what you see is that same group of dosing that I showed you. So tumors to which we give greater than 70 gray, tumors to which we give something like 60, and tumors to which we give this low dose. And on the right, there's the 8,000 patients and what they actually experience when it comes to a radiation effect. So sure, at the top, the patients who got greater than 70 gray, for the most part, have a high effect. But you can see that there's some blue lines interspersed at the top. At the bottom, the same is true, or the, or the contrapositive is true. The patients who receive a low dose of radiation, for the most part, have a lower effect. But you can also see this in patients in the bottom with red lines. And in the middle, it's all over the place, which suggests that, you know, really, when we think we're giving a high dose, we aren't always giving a high effect. And when we're giving a low dose, we aren't always giving a low effect. There's some patients who experience the opposite in each of these cases. Um, and so, really, coming back to this same slide, this is that idea of the high and low cut point. So by itself, RSI hasn't been super useful because it requires this cut point. But if you start thinking of it in a continuous way, you have an opportunity to really move forward. So let's look at all of the data together. So here we have um, guard and RSI. So on the top, this is standard dosing. On the bottom, uh, sorry, on the top is actually a series of, of patient cohorts we've collected where we have the actual dosing given, and on the bottom is the same cohorts with RSI, and you can see both recurrence and survival. So for almost every single one of these, or sorry, for every single one of these diseases, you can choose a cut point where your hazard ratios will fall below one significantly. So there's some that overlap, you're seeing here as, a, as the continuous entire cohort. So not all of these diseases work out with GARD as a continuous variable or RSI as a continuous variable, but you can dichotomize high and low and still do well, which is all those publications I showed you earlier. If you then do a pooled analysis, however, of all of these diseases together, what you find is that GARD truly is a continuous predictor of radiation response for both recurrence and survival. So this is a brand new analysis that we're just publishing now. Um, I should have added also uh, student Jessica Scarborough who's helped out with this work a lot. But what we're finding is that together, it is a continuous, a linear, linearly continuous predictor, which is a very powerful concept. Um, and so, so people might know Mike Catan of Nomogram fame helped us understand this in a pooled analysis fashion. So what we're really realizing is that it's not just a high-low predictor of radiation response, but it is truly a continuous predictor. For every unit increase in guard, that is every unit increase in radiation effect, we have concomitant recurrent uh, unit increases in both recurrent, or sorry, decreases in, in, in recurrence and, and better in survival that are highly significant. And so we're really looking at something that is a pan-cancer predictor of response to radiation. So that's the, the beginning of, that's the end of the beginning. Um, I just want to stop just briefly to sort of summarize what we said. Um, is that this GARD, which is the genomically adjusted radiation dose, is the first clinically actionable connection between dose and genomics. So the first ability to predict um, what dose is being given to an individual patient. So if I say I give this patient A 45 gray and patient B 45 gray, and I have their gene expression, I can really tell you whether or not they receive the same biological effect or not. Um, and so here I've been focusing on RSI as a basis. And in particular, you've noticed that I only was predicting alpha, not beta and alpha. So I can't say anything about hypofractionation or hyperfractionation, only about standard fractionation. Guard, is at, guard itself is agnostic to signature, because you can, if you have the alpha and the beta, you can make these predictions for any dose. So this is where I really think that the, the next generation needs to, to come in and help us, and there's more work needed. Um, and what I also want to focus on is we can do this now. And as a matter of fact, uh, this is a test that actually can be ordered and should be available um, within the next few weeks as something that can be ordered um, commercially. Okay, so that's the beginning of the end. And now I want to focus on uh, the, the sort of newer, as of yet, unpublished work. It was actually, um, we just got revisions back a few weeks ago, and, and I'll explain the work that we've done so far. But we're going to shift gears slightly, and we're going we're gonna to use the same underlying models, um, but we're going to talk about normal tissue complications as well. And so, so first, let's remember... Um, the idea of tumor control probability. So I think this is kind of an interesting small 
um, segue. So if we remember on the left, we have these canonical models of tumor control, where we know that tumor control probability of TCP is this negative exponential function, and the surviving fraction, as I showed you, is also a negative exponential function. So this sort of, this, this TCP naturally lives on zero to one, and we're all taught that this looks like a sigmoid curve. Um, we're also taught that, that this, this should be clinically relevant because we have these sigmoid curves for um, patient response, right? So if we, if we plot um, dose and response probability, we end up with something like a sigmoid as well. And so this is something in rad bio where we think that these two things are quite, quite well correlated. So differences in individual patients and, and on the left, if you remember correctly, so if you take a cohort of patients with the same alpha and beta, we can still get this sigmoid curve if we use these Poisson statistics, which have been shown. And anyone with their radiation boards under their belts will recognize these Poisson statistics. But I would argue that the underlying reason for this heterogeneity is not the stochastic Poisson, Poisson statistics that we've been learning. Let's go back to our original aha moment, where we've seen these distributions within disease. So I would argue that the, that the lesson here is that the patients within a given disease are not the same. They do not have the same alpha and beta. They don't say brain, therefore alpha, beta, 10. We'd say instead brain, every patient is different. Pancreas, every patient is different. So remember, it's typically bimodal, which is strange and we'll come to in a moment, but it's also heterogeneous. Here are the same distributions just plotted out as KDEs, where you can really get a sense of what they look like. And I'm going to focus in on a couple as exemplars to teach a small lesson. So let's look at glioma. So if this was an in-person talk, I would do this more Socratically. But um, this, to me, looks like what I would assume to be a, bio a distribution in biology. So if I'm going to assume what the distribution looks like for any polygenic trait, I would make the underlying assumption that it's normal. And I think that that makes a lot of sense for us. We know height, weight, IQ, all these things sort of look something like a, a normal distribution. I then challenge you to think about what the cumulative distribution or CDF of this looks like. So if I tell you that this is what distribution of radiation response looks like, and then I integrate this or by dose, the CDF of this is a classic sigmoid. So you don't need anything other than a normal distribution to recover a sigmoid curve from a population. And of course, sigmoids can come in different flavors, and therefore your sig sorry, normals can come in different flavors, and therefore so can your sigmoids. So you don't need Poisson statistics to recover a sigmoidal TCP curve. Another, the different hypothesis is that instead, you only need to have a distribution of radiation response, which I think makes a lot more sense, to be honest. And we've, I've shown you, I think, data to suggest that. So let's look at a different example. Let's look at the large bowel adenocarcinoma. This is this beautiful bimodal distribution. To me, that actually looks like two normal distributions shoved together. So what happens, what does the CDF of two normal distributions look like? So let's take two normal distributions, let's separate their means by something called delta, and then let's ask the question, what happens as delta goes from zero to large? So when delta is zero, it's a sim simply a normal distribution on the left, but as we increase delta, you have uh, the blue double sigmoid that sort of starts stacking up on itself. And if you think about the noise within clinical trials, it's going to be really hard to tell apart the predicted distribution, which is the dotted red, from the real distribution, which is the blue, because clinical data is, is noisy, as we know. But what does this mean in terms of these distributions I just showed you? So here's just four examples of sort of an increasing delta, if you will, for individual diseases. So the glioma looks just like a single normal distribution. Breast is starting to look like two normals. Large bowel has got to be two normal distributions. So decomposing these distributions, we start to be able to ask questions we couldn't ask before. So what do we expect the TCP curves to look like for these distributions? Well, for glioma, we expect it to look just like a sigmoid, but all the way over in large bowel adeno, we expect it to look like two sigmoids on top of one another, which begs a few different questions. One, is this two different diseases? Is this left versus right colon? Is this high versus low? rectal? Probably not. We think it's a genomic difference. But it definitely suggests that the patients in the left hand normal need a heck of a lot less dose than the patients in the right hand normal. And so this idea of stratification of just high and low is getting at the heart of that RSI cut point. And what if, it, what, if what we were doing before with that cut point was simply wiggling our, our dose in order to find this resistant versus sensitive population? 
And if that's the case, are we missing out on a huge treasure map? Are we missing out on an opportunity to get a radio phenotype distribution that really teaches us some more about how to treat these individual diseases? So now let's focus in on just the lung as an example. This is a lot of patients. It's a couple, it's a thousand or so patients, and we have a huge variety of radiation response. So let's focus in here a bit. Now this is a preprint, um, and if you're interested, if you're a Twitter person, you can follow me on Twitter and find, here's the entire paper in a single series of tweets, but this is a, a preprint that should be coming out um, soon in, hopefully, I'm not going to jinx myself, but we've had very minor revisions to a journal of thoracic oncology, so hopefully you'll see this soon, where we're going to try to take this idea of this heterogeneity, looking at this beautiful distribution, and try to understand if the next steps as well. And I hope that, I hope that, that you understand where I'm going with this. So... Let's, t let's decompose a real cohort. So this, this cohort of 1,100 or so is post-surgical patients who were genomically stratified, but we don't have outcomes from. What we do have as outcomes from 65 patients with, in this, with the same disease who are getting post-operative radiation therapy. Again, uh, um, a disease state that is notably in question in radiation oncology, right? We run trials for PORT all the time. We have meta-analyses for PORT um, where... <laughs> you know, N2 versus N3, and, and there's a lot of different um, reasons to think why PORT has been positive and negative in trials. Another frustrating thing about post-op radiation is that the dose, you can give anything from 50 to 70 and it's dealer's choice. So that's hard for us to understand without some sort of stratification. But luckily, we now have one. So this is a perfect opportunity for us to use this idea of GARD because we have a variety of dose and we have a variety of genomic information and outcomes. So let's look and see what we can learn from that. So let's take these 65 patients. The survival of all the patients of all comers is in the upper left. So we're going to call that S of T. And then we're going to do what we've done before. We're going to stratify that group by good and bad response. So we're kind of going to reverse p-hack, if you will, and ask the question, what value of dose best stratifies the patients with their known outcomes? And so in this case, it's a guard of 33. It's not always going to be the same for any given cohort, but in this case it is. So now we're able to sort of decompose that surviving function into two different, a linear combination of these two. So we have got um, a hazard ratio for each. And now what we can do is we can look at the real dose for all of these patients within the two groups. So what we're going to do is define something called the Rx RSI, which is the prescription dose needed based on the genomics. So Rx like prescription and RSI like the genomics. And this is going to be the dose at which the physical radiation dose, so in this case 33, uh, sorry, the guard dose, which is 33 guard. If you get above that, you fall into the C2 group, so you do well. If you fall below that dose, you fall into the C1 group, so you do poorly. So this is the real clinical data. This is where you lie. And if you got above 33 guard, C2, below 33 guard, C1. Now, we can now take that guard and go backwards through the algorithm we just discussed before and figure out what needed radiation dose that would be. So if you want to get 33, a guard of 33 for a patient with 0.4 RSI, you need something like 74 gray. You just read up and follow it over. If you want to have the same guard for a patient with like 0.1 RSI, you'd need something like 20 gray of real radiation dose. So in this cohort, what we're able to do is plot the actual dose given, which was between 50 and 70, as discussed. But we're then able to show where that falls on this line. So basically, if you're above the blue line, you're in this blue area, we show that you're biologically treated and you fall into the C2 group. If you're below the line, you fall into the poor outcomes, so you're underdosed. The white envelope is sort of plus or minus 10%. So we're, we're going to just define sort of three groups, the very overdosed, the very underdosed, and then those who sort of fall pretty close to within where we expect. So what's cool about this is that now that we're armed with this concept of what you needed, we can now talk about by how much you are under or overdosed. So this is kind of a cool concept. So now these two patients, the blue one, for example, you now see that patient got something like 50 gray, but we expect they would need something like 80 to be cured. Whereas the patient in red got something like 60 gray, and we would have thought they would have needed something like 20. So these are two extreme examples, but you can, you can imagine the patient on the left who got 60 gray and needed 20 is cured, but has a massive increase 
in hazard ratio for normal tissue, comp normal tissue complications than they would have if they were given 20. And the same on the other side. The patient who is now given 40 less gray has no chance of being radio cured. So taking these two things together, we can finally have the opportunity to think about tumor control and normal tissue complications. So if we look on the bottom, these are, these are models taken from Quantec and from New England Journal, thinking about how NTCP changes with dose. So panel B shows we're going to use lung as the example. So the three driving things for lung are esophagitis, pneumonitis, and, and cardiac events. Also the three things people are talking about for 0617. And as you have an increase in dose, you have an increase in normal tissue complication. And so let's take that patient who got 40 gray too much. Now we can start thinking about how much of a change there would be between what we, what we gave them and what they needed and how much of an increase in complication effect there would have been. So now we've radio cured them, but we've given them a 40 gray increase in normal tissue complications versus maybe if we give them 20 gray, we still radio cure them, but they have no increase. So we can now think about the change in complication probability expected based on under or overdosing. And so we now have what we call PLC, which we're calling predicted local control, which is this idea of um, radio curability modified by increased hazard ratio. So you have the surviving fraction for 74, surviving the survival curve for 74 as an example, and the surviving curve for 60, but then those are modulated by the individual hazard ratios for event. If you look at this and you run an in silico clinical trial, so you take this exact sort of formalism, you pull the real distribution of RSI that I showed you earlier, you roll dice, you select patients, and you basically run an exact version of 0617, you get perfectly overlapping confidence intervals for predicted local control with actually um, no difference between 60 and 74. And if you look out at the individual years, this falls directly in line with the reported outcomes of 60 versus 74 and 0617. And so you don't need um, so if you had run this trial in silico before, you would have realized that 60 versus 74 should not have been a positive trial, per our assumptions. However, thinking a little bit more about this distribution, this shouldn't be super surprising. So look where 60 and 74 lie. On the left is the actual distribution. Patients in blue in that distribution didn't need any more than 60. Patients in red needed more than 74 to begin with. The patients who it mattered for, 60, between 60 and 74, happened to fall exactly in this tiny valley between the two distributions. So you could have predicted just looking at this distribution a priori that modifying dose between 60 and 74 has an incredibly small chance of, of showing you anything. Only 20% of patients, or 18.6% of patients, even would have mattered. So now all of a sudden your power calculations are out the window. Because what you're looking at is an entirely a tiny, tiny, small subgroup that would have actually mattered. I would suggest even going to 60 versus 80, you would have had a better chance because you would have increased and you would have caught the beginning of that uptick in the second cohort. And as a matter of fact, if you go through and do these models, if you were to stratify this and randomize within 60 versus 74, um, you actually would have had something like a 25% uh, change in local control if you had given the patients who needed the patients in the blue cohort, 60, the patients in the red cohort, 70, uh, patients in red and gray, 74, we would have predicted a positive trial. And that increase, that would have even increased further if you would allow, have allowed to go even below 60 and then give the real dose needed to allow for decreased complications. So what we think is this is a rational explanation for the failure of 0617, but also an opportunity to really understand how this works. So this is all a lot to do for one individual patient. So I want to show you a little tool we've made. If you point your camera uh, your uh, iPhone or, or your smartphone camera at that QR code, it'll go to a website where you can play with this tool while I'm talking it through. I'm going to show you three screenshots and then I think I'm nearly through. So what you do is you ask the question, okay, what is a patient's given RSI? So in this, in this example, 0.2 uh, in the, for this patient, and let's say, what, is, what if, about, if I give the patient 60 gray? What happens? So you can see in the upper left panel, the red is the 60 gray that you're giving, the yellow, horizontal, the yellow vertical line is the, what we predict this patient actually needs. So this patient needed 40 gray, you're giving them 60 gray. And here we show if you want to, you can sort of play with the normal tissue parameters directly. So your actual plan could go in here in the bottom, and you could actually look at the real tissue doses to each of these things that are driving this outcome. If you 
And then this, this is what we predict the actual survival to look like over five years for this patient. If you then gave the same patient 74 gray, you can actually see a detriment in survival. So it actually goes down from here to here. We're still radio curing this patient, but we're now overdosing them even further. A different example is a patient with a high RSI. So here's a patient who we actually predict needs 74 or 72 gray, as an example, who we're giving 60 gray to. This patient has a terrible survival curve because they fall in that bad group. If we're able to then take that same patient and elevate our given dose above, we can snap them into the larger group. And so this, this tool, together with the genomic measure, really allows you to formulate clinical trial hypotheses individually, and you can personalize it using their actual normal tissue complications, um, and with, of course, a model. But this is the same model used for, for decades for NTCP. And so um, I hope what I've shown you is that, um, that some of these, what we, we, what we posit to be fundamental biological distributions per disease um, should help us to guide dosing, and in particular should teach us where these sweet spots lie. And actually, if you go back and look at all those distributions I showed you, it's pretty, pretty shocking to look. Almost every single disease's current standard of care dose catches most of the first distribution and, uh, and misses the second one. So over the course of 100 years of empirical clinical trials, we've sort of accidentally fallen into this sort of middle, like, like 60 or 60 so or gray in, in this example, catches the majority of people that you can catch without going to crazy high doses. And so it's interesting to look back and realize that there's not a rational connection. Um, so what I would argue is that for every disease site, we need to rethink how we think about dosing. So instead of thinking about gray, we think about radiation effect, and I think we can do this through genomics, but we have to start. And, and this actually is a nice, uh, this is the last slide, by the way. This is a nice callback to what Dr. Canham told us at the beginning from his mentor, whose name is escaping me, but um, make measurements. In radiation oncology, we don't make biological measurements. We say what happened to the patient and what we gave, but we don't have any other lens by which to, to really parse out what's going on. And I think this is, this is maybe a, a way forward. And so that, that's the end. I'd just like to say thanks again to those who I get to work with, and, and thanks again to um, Dr. Canham and, and the rest.